My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this is Dudes from the Can. Aeration is an emergency measure, not a license for point source polluters to continue to pollute. The mouth of almost every river on planet Earth has a hypoxic area, often called a dead zone, and the ocean around it at least some part of the year. Hypoxic means low dissolved oxygen level, which may be caused by eutrophication due to excess nutrients from agricultural runoff or stratification of seawater due to high temperature and low density freshwater riding over top instead of mixing as a river outflows into the sea or all of the above. The Mississippi River and other slow movers that flow into the Gulf of Mexico collectively contribute to an area of low dissolved oxygen that can span tens of thousands of square kilometers and typically happens in the summer. This phenomenon has probably occurred on a smaller scale, naturally in many places over the eons, but is exacerbated by industrial agriculture. At the least, fisheries can be significantly depleted. At worst, hypoxia of significant swaths of ocean water can trigger a biological cascade failure that can lead to anoxic conditions that are difficult for sea life to recover from. Last year, the entire coast of Florida experienced this kind of holocaust due to algae blooms associated with runoff from sugarcane fields. The result was the loss of sea life at an unprecedented scope of diversity and scale. No life form was left unscathed, including sea turtles, sea mammals, and birds of every description. The ultimate reason we should care about these kinds of events is because anoxic conditions resulting from cascade failure of the oceans has led to planet-wide wholesale extinction in the past. Maintaining the good health of the oceans isn't just a socio-economic or moral imperative. It's a matter of life and death for us all. Fluid photochemical systems like those in the Earth's biosphere have a nasty habit of being wildly unpredictable, with hair triggers nested in feedback loops of arcane biochemical complexity. The best way to keep bad things from happening is to keep the life forms happy. And the best way to do that is to give them oxygen. Asphyxiated animals release chemicals like hydrogen sulfide that suck more oxygen out of the water to make more dead animals from asphyxiation. Keeping some of the animals alive keeps most of the animals alive, including, dare I say, us. Episodic hypoxia in various places along the entire length of the Mississippi River has been a problem long enough that over the past 100 years a veritable army of federal, state, and local government bodies have been tasked with mitigating its effects. The Mississippi River, Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force, or intergovernmental bodies like it, have been at work on this issue in one form or another since the 60s. Essentially, the overall hypoxia mitigation strategy comes down to trying to limit point source emissions of nitrogen and phosphorus into the watershed as well as monitoring forecasting hypoxic events and reporting progress back to Congress every two years. By the early 2000s, a goal to limit the area of hypoxic water in the Gulf of Mexico to 5,000 square kilometers was set for the year 2015. The date of that milestone has subsequently been moved back to 2035. Unfortunately, apocalyptic rainfall in the heartland due to climate change easily overwhelms most human efforts to mitigate pollution due to flooding. The bottom line is that the best efforts of any intergovernmental task force may never be enough to overcome the massive force of Mother Nature in the throes of a changing climate. Mother Nature is going to need help. The British aerate the Thames River whenever significant rainfall threatens dissolved oxygen content. Many studies have been done about the efficacy of aeration on remediation of polluted waterways. Aeration can be complicated in stratified lakes, aerate at the wrong time during an algae bloom, and the situation can be made worse. Maintaining the thermal stratum in a lake while oxygenating the lower levels often produce the best results. However, the fresh water coming from a river into a salt water gulf will eventually be mixed. Disturbing the stratification sooner rather than later while aerating shouldn't matter. But marine biologists should always be consulted before embarking on any course of action. This is a quote from Trying to Breathe Life into the Bay by Howard Leibitt, the Baltimore Sun back in 2003.
Some scientists warn that potential solutions may create problems. For example, aerators could dislodge harmful sediment from the bottom and nutrients that have sunk down could be stirred up, feeding the algae and lowering the oxygen again. Blumenthal, who is the subject of the story, he's a guy that designed a boat with seven aerators on it to tackle low oxygen content in the Chesapeake Bay, says his boat was designed to avoid that pitfall by keeping the aerator suspended in the water. So, there's many different ways to skin that cat. Consider that the idea of aerating the Chesapeake Bay has been suggested before, but not much seems to have been done on that order. So we must always ask, if it's not being done, why? This is the question I'm putting out there to everyone. Is there a downside to aerating a marine body of water like the Gulf of Mexico or the Chesapeake Bay? A big argument against pursuing aeration of outflows into the Gulf of Mexico as a prophylactic measure against widespread hypoxia is that this action might encourage polluters to continue to pollute. The problem is that in an age of epic precipitation and flooding, all the best efforts in the world may not be enough to prevent conditions that produce widespread low oxygen content in the marine environment. Stormier marine conditions that go along with climate change may at times stir up Gulf waters enough to offset the effects of low dissolved oxygen and high nutrient content. Nevertheless, could aerating a significant portion of the lower Mississippi River, the Chesapeake Bay, the Indian River, or any number of other estuaries possibly hurt? If so, how? And that's my question to you. Leave a comment and tell us what you think. Even better, tell us what you know. Experience, history, scientific studies, etc. Someone out there always has the answer. In the future, we will be focusing on even more solutions to various problems caused by climate change, such as more on the science and good use of aeration, food production, energy production, and communication. We will continue to avoid politics as much as possible because no matter what happens politically, we are all physically dialed in for shit hitting the fan of one form or another all over the world. Good luck. The next Mississippi River Gulf of Mexico Watershed Nutrient Task Force report to Congress should be coming out in August of this year, 2019. Judging by the date of the last one, August 2017. And this is what the cover looks like. EPA, Mississippi River, Gulf of Mexico, Watershed Nutrient Task Force 2017 report to Congress. And that's about it for now. My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this has been News from the Can. If you like this content, please rate, comment, and subscribe. And as always, I love you guys. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for watching. See ya.